and I had spoken to the staff of Senator John McCain. So I had, uh, and, and uh, I had different ideas. Uh, I will cherish for being stamped out with uh, Tomo and, and, and the other <laughs> torture chambers you care to name. So the 9-11 Truth Alliance meeting, which uh, every so much bigger than what you know. And it's so much deeper, and it's so much more tragic once you have the truth. So on that note, uh, let me just take you to, uh, I'm actually going to start, I'm going to move you a little bit ahead to remember when George Bush and, and uh, uh, was, they were counting the votes in Florida. Okay? I'm going to take you back to November of 2000. Uh, they had not yet declared that uh, George Bush had won the election. We, I was having a meeting with the no, full knowledge and permission of the CIA with, the Iraq, with Iraq's ambassador to the United Nations on resuming the weapons inspections. It is very important for you to understand that country, this, this story with 9-11 also ties in deeply to what happened with Iraq. And contrary to everything you were told, the Iraqis were not resistant to weapons inspections. They had a comprehensive agenda. The CIA had already a comprehensive agenda for resolving the entire conflict without war at all. And it involved weapons inspections, cooperation with anti-terrorism, and uh, major financial contracts for U.S. corporations, and oil. Uh, and this would be developed over a period of time. But we already had, by November of 2000, we already had an agreement with the Iraqi government. We had a framework agreement that was, at that point, it was undefined, not so well defined, and, and we had to make it defined. But they had already consented to all of these things. They wanted peace with us. And um, so by February of 2001, the Iraqis had agreed to offer, to invite the FBI to send a task force into Baghdad with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations and to make arrests of terror suspects. This is very important for you to understand. So this is like the, the background of what you have to know. Okay. In April of 2001, I was summoned to my... Oh, this is already happening. The Comprehensive Peace Framework, those discussions are already underway. And I am, at this point, the chief asset covering the Iraqi embassy and the Libya house, both of them, I do both of them, and Yemen and Syria and Egypt and Malaysia. But, yeah, but Iraq and Libya are my primary countries. And uh, so I'm a back channel, which means that the government, the U.S. government gives me messages to give the Iraqis, and then the Iraqis give me messages to give to Washington. So I know everything. Every single conversation is going through me. And I can tell you that in April of 2001, I was summoned to my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Fuse, and he said he had a message for me to deliver to New York at the earliest possible convenience. And the message was this. We are looking for information on a conspiracy to hijack airplanes. We expect the target to be the World Trade Center, we think they're going to fly the airplanes into the World Trade Center. And uh, we want the Iraqis to provide any, it's called actionable intelligence. Actionable intelligence is a name, an airport hub, a flight number, something that's going to help us identify who they are, where they're meeting, what their nationalities are, anything like this. And he says, he gives me a message, and he says, we want this information, and I want you to tell the Iraqis that if they fail to give us this information, and if it is later determined that they knew the information and they did not give it to us, then the United States is prepared to go to war with Iraq. Okay, this is April of 2001. Well, I went up to, to New York and I was very, we were in the middle of these great negotiations. We already had an invitation, we, from February of 2001, we had an invitation for the FBI to come to Baghdad. So I go up to New York. I'm very pleasant. I'm very polite. 
There's no reason to be nasty with these people. They want peace. I say, hey, could you please send a message to Baghdad? We'd like this information. If you come across anything, you know, you've all... Saddam had been one of our best sources on terrorism throughout the 1990s. Iraq hated terrorism because they believed that... Um, they hated Islamic jihadis. He hate, I mean, he did. He, whether you like Saddam or not, whether you hate Saddam or not, he hated Islamic conservatives. He was convinced that they would take advantage of the, uh, the crumbling of authority in Baghdad under the sanctions and that they would then uh, try to overthrow, overturn his government and the poverty of the people from the, the sanctions would, would fuel this, this problem, would, would help overturn his government. So he wanted to help us at every turn keep these people, you know, from, from becoming too powerful. Okay. And so we knew this. So when I go to New York in April of 2001, I'm very friendly. And I say, hey, look, you, could you send the message to Baghdad? Let them know we're looking for this. Thanks. And the message from the Iraqis in April of 2001 is, hey, send the FBI. We've already agreed to send the You can. We've already invited you to send the FBI. Come on. Tell them, just bring them on. Sure. Wow, you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> okay, so I go back to Rich I go back to, to Washington and I get a phone call from Richard. He said, "Come down, come down to my office. I want to hear what they said." I go down. I said, "Oh, I was real polite. I, yeah, yeah, you know, I gave him the message. Sure, sure." He said, "I didn't tell you to be nice. I told you to tell those. You, this is going to be on television, right? Is this is going to be on. Like, okay, well, we'll be. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll soft pedal what he said. He was like, you, t you go back to, you stupid, goddamn blankety, 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 blankety. I told you to tell those SOB, MFers, God, GD, blah, 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 screaming, circling me around his conference. I can, I'll never forget it. Circling his conference desk, ranting and raving, waving his arms around. He didn't do that very often. He's, he does not have that kind of personality. He's a very calm man. And, he feels that if you're, if you're really angry at somebody, then the more calm you are, the more dangerous you are. That's CIA. He's old school CIA. Okay, so he's screaming now. And I go back, he's like, you go back to New York and you deliver the message exactly the way that I told you to deliver the message. And I said, well, Richard, I don't want them to think I'm threatening them because, you know, I'm a, I believe in, like, negotiations and conflict resolution. He said, no, no. I don't want them to think you are threatening them. And he said, I don't want them to think I am threatening them. I want you to tell them this threat of war originates at the highest level of government above the CIA director and above the Secretary of State. That it would be three men, President George Bush, Vice President Dick Cheney, and Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and no one else. Those are the three people who are threatening war. And I want to be really clear about the message that I was ordered to give them. We demand that you turn over any actionable, any fragment of intelligence outlining a, a, a conspiracy involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center. If you withhold this information, if we discover that you have withheld this information and the attack occurs, then we will bomb you back to the Stone Age you will be bombed harder than you've ever been bombed before. You well, I pointed the finger at Rumsfeld a little way through because he was involved with the moon hoax. Mm. The two um, CIA agents had no family at all. They disappeared. Mm. Right, and then they end up killing uh, Stanley Kubrick. Mm. And what part of Seoul and the six thousand products of Asta chain in it? That's right. Well, that uh, fellow who uh, wrote um, two thousand and one, a space odyssey. Space odyssey. Mm. Clark, isn't it? Arthur C. Clarke? Arthur C. Yeah. Right. Pedophile? Hmm. So, um, this kind of mentality has set the stage to be where this lady is uh, 
obviously a saint, otherwise she'd be dead. Mm. Maybe you should see if you can get some details on her age and so forth and you do less than that. You will be destroyed. You cannot, you've mm -hmm. never been hit the way we're going to hit you now. Okay, so, okay, so I yeah. went up and I delivered that message. This is May of 2001. FBI. In June and July, practically every single week, my CIA handler, Dr. Richard Hughes, and I talked about 9-11. And it was very clear that the intelligence uh, community was being prepped for two things. One, to expect airplane hijacking. July now, I have to be honest 17, with you, because I know a lot of you are interested in the controlled demolition. They prepped us to expect the airplane hijacking. Isaiah, they told us about it. Armageddon. Mm. They tried, to, they demand, like my CIA handler demanded that Iraq had to give us this, and they, they d insisted that if, they, if it happened, there would, be a, there would be dire consequences. Now, what you're going to see in my book, and, I, and we have more copies of my book outside, we can, we've got more, or more here too, um, that the, 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 there was something else Extreme going on that summer that was really mm. beautiful. This peace framework that we had been working on was, was magnificent. It was turning out just Linda. glorious for a peace Seven, one, seven, six, three. The Iraqis Ooh. were now offering the weapons inspections, which of course we, the, we, the United States had a very rigorous standards the, uh, for their weapons inspections. You and Iraq her? was offering cooperation with anti-terrorism to yeah, allow the FBI to go control. in. And Iraq started to offer a lot more. A lot more came on the table. By the summer, by June and July of 2001, Iraq was offering the United, United States preferential contracts. Now, think about the economy Mother today. Died in preferential contracts for the United States corporations on telecommunications, health care, hospital equipment, and pharmaceuticals, and transportation. Iraq offered to buy but one million American-manufactured automobiles Born every year. In Anchorage, she attended East Anchorage High School on a student. She earned a master's degree in public policy from the London School of Economics, worked as a temporary reporter. The Seattle Post Intelligence for 13 weeks in 1987, and as an editorial writer at the Everett Herald in Everett, Washington, 1989. She was a researcher at U.S. News and World Report, 1990-91. She then worked for Representative Peter DeFazio, Democrat, Oregon, 93, before joining the staff of Senator Carol Mosley, Brown, Illinois. She worked as press secretary and speech writer. January 8, 2003, she delivered a letter to Andrew Card, in her letter, she urged Card to intercede with President George W. Bush to not invade Iraq and offered to act as a back channel in negotiations. Andrew Card is her second cousin. Her first politically related contact with former Chief of Staff was around 2000. And one. So she's actually very well connected, uh, her uncle. Yeah, why don't why don't I set that up with her cousin? This doesn't make sense. Well, seven one seven six three does. Yeah, I know, but this doesn't make sense. She was arrested March eleventh, two thousand four, Tacoma. Park, Maryland, and charged with acting as an unregistered agent of a foreign government. The indictment alleged that she accepted $10,000 US from the Iraqi intelligence service in 2002. Linda denied receiving the money, but confirmed taking a trip to Baghdad. She was released on bond March 13, 2004, to attend an arraignment. The following week, she was incarcerated at Carswell Air Force Base in Fort Worth, Texas, the psychological evaluation then moved to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in Manhattan. In 2006, she was released from prison after Judge Michael B. Mukasey ruled that Linda was unfit to stand trial and could not, could not be forced to take antipsychotic medication to make her competent to stand trial. He noted that the severity of Linda's mental illness, which he described as a lengthy delusional history 
weakened the prosecution's case. In his decision, he wrote, Lindauer could not act successfully as an agent of the Iraqi government without in some way influencing normal people. There is no indication that Lindauer ever came close to influencing anyone or could have. The indictment charges only what it describes as an unsuccessful attempt to influence an unnamed government official and the record shows that even lay people recognise that she is seriously disturbed. 2008 letter Loretta A. Preska of the Federal District Court in New York City reaffirmed that Lindauer was mentally unfit to stand trial. January 16, 2009, the government decided to not go ahead with the prosecution, saying prosecuting Lindauer would no longer have been in the interests of justice. Lindauer has written a self-published book about her experience, Extreme Prejudice, the terrifying story of the Patriot Act and the cover-ups of 9-11 in Iraq. Lindauer claims that for a number of years she had worked for the CIA and DIA, undertaking communications with the Iraqi government, serving as a back channel in negotiations. She started making visits to the Libyan mission at the United Nations in 1995 and lasting until 2001. Some of the meetings were talks with Iraqi intelligence service officials at the United Nations. Ten years. Think of what that would have done to the economy. Think about non-dual use factory production. And all of this was because the CIA was like, you know, if we're going to give up these darn sanctions, we're going to, we're going to, <laughs> we're going to take a pound of flesh with it. They had no, you know, and whether you like the CIA or not, and most of you, 99% of you don't like the CIA, I realize that, of course. But the CIA was doing what it's supposed to do, whether you like it or not. They were taking care of what is in the best interest of the United States government, would be best interest of the United States economy, and they were not going to let Iraq punish the United States. And I hated the sanctions. I was doing this because I hated the sanctions. I was doing it because I thought because they had destroyed education. They wiped out literacy in a single generation. They destroyed the hospitals and the healthcare system. Iraq performed the second heart transplant in the world. And we wiped them out. Okay? Uh, 11,000 people died every month. By the end of 1996, 500,000 children had died of sanctions, and they only counted five-year-olds and younger. They didn't even count the six-year-olds, because the United Nations was holding back the numbers. And after that report in, at the, in December of 96, they stopped counting it. They, the United Nations never published another report on the deaths. So frequently what you will hear is that only 500,000 children died, but in fact, they continued to die, and approximately one million children died. They were babies. What did, they weren't even alive when the first Gulf War happened. This was an offense against, you know, this is genocide. This is a mass genocide. So that's my motivation. But the CIA did not have my motivation. They were out to make sure that the United States was not going to be punished for what they had done. And I was like, and, and believe me, by this point, we just wanted to get rid of the sanctions. The Iraqis were like, if they don't get rid of the sanctions, you bet. We'll give them anything they want. So before 9-11, you could have had every single thing you possibly could dream of. And if the CIA could have thought of more to ask for, we would have. We would have asked for more. It was shameless. Okay. So, so you have peace that's breaking out in the Middle East. You have the 9-11 warnings. And then in August of 2001, uh, we went into high mode, high activity mode. On all, I can tell you the exact day, uh, on August 2nd, and after I tell you this, I'll open it up to questions. Um, on August 2nd was the uh, Senate nomination hearings for Robert Mueller, who to head the FBI. He was going to be the FBI director. And I was on the phone with my CIA handler, Richard Fuse, and I said, there's not one single terrorism investigation this man hasn't thrown. He, Oops. <laughs> That's okay. He threw the nine. He threw the Oklahoma City bombing investigation. He threw Lockerbie, and I said this man should not be the FBI director when this next attack occurs. And Richard Fuse said to me, "My God, what if there is no FBI director when this happens?" I said, "Do you think it's that soon?" Do you think the attack is imminent? He said, "Oh yeah." He said, "It's absolutely just in the next couple of weeks." 
He said, this is, he said, I don't want, and I said, well, God, Richard, I'll go back to New York right now, and I'll get, I'll pump the Iraqis and see if they've got anything from Baghdad. I'll see if they have any news for us. And he said, oh, my God, Susan, don't go back to, do not go back to New York City. It's too dangerous. We are expecting a, the use of a miniature thermonuclear device. And they were not afraid that I was going to be hurt by, like, falling debris in the World Trade Center. I wasn't going to be at the World Trade Center. They were afraid of radiation contamination, like the wind blowing the radi radioactive stuff. And that's what they see. He was like, don't go up there. We're expecting mass casualties. And I said, well, Richard, you know, I'll go up the, you know, the day after. This was a, I can tell you the exact day. It was a Thursday. And I said, I will go up to New York on Saturday, and I'll report to you on Monday. And we'll just find out if the Iraqis have anything to give us. I went up to New York. The Iraqis said, ain't got nothing. We don't know. We don't know anything about this. You keep telling us about this. The only way we know about it is because you're talking about it. But we don't have any information to give you. And if we did, we understand the consequences. We know that if we don't help you, you're going to go to war with us if you think we did. And we, if there was anything we could give you, we would do it. So I go back and I report that on August 6th. On August 6th, there is a memo to the president telling him that this, this is a high security threat, that it is an emergency level, that it's imminent. Okay. I, at my meeting with Richard Fuse, Richard Fuse tells, does something very important. He tells me that because of my direct contacts with Iraq and Libya, I should be the one, I am perfectly positioned, because everyone likes to think that Iraq and Libya are involved in terrorism to begin with, I should be the one to contact U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft's office, and I should tell them that we're looking for an emer what's called an emergency broadcast alert across all agencies seeking any fragment of intelligence involving airplane hijackings and a strike on the World Trade Center, identified specifically. And I, call, I make that phone call. Uh, that, that con my conversation was refused is August 6th. Probably August 7th, August 8th, I call them. And immediately I talk to the, pri I have a private phone number. See, huh, you guys couldn't get this number, but I have it, okay? I have the number inside the Attorney General's office. I'm not calling a switchboard. I'm calling his private staff. Okay, I'm calling his like his his government liaison office. His is you know no no let me no that's not true. I call his private internal office. There are about 20 members of his private staff. His legislative director is there. His government relations person is there. But I call inside that office, and they give me the office for the, the phone number for the office of counterterrorism. They say repeat exactly what you just told us and tell them. I am told that John Ashcroft said, oh, those CIA people keep talking about terrorism, and they keep talking about this darn airplane hijacking, and they're so paranoid, and why do they keep bugging us about it? That's what I'm told they said. <laughs> uh, but I did what I did. And when I did that, I apparently tripped some wires because it denied the White House, it denied the Justice Department and the Attorney General's Office of deniability, plausible deniability. And that's very important. And that is why they came after me so hard and tried to destroy me utterly, because they could not admit to you that we had absolutely anticipated this thing. We knew it was going to happen exactly as it did go down, with one exception. And here's where I just, and then I'm, I'm going to finish this, and then I'll open the floor to questions. Um, the, uh, what, what, it, what I have learned since then, now all the things that I've told you are things I did directly. So I'm telling you, I'm not relating what somebody else did or a conversation that somebody else had that has been reported to me. This is direct primary knowledge from my own experience. But what I'm going to tell you now is from somebody else, okay? And so I, I distinguish these two things. I have been told that some, by somebody who saw the videos that at the World Trade Center, on approximately, from approximately August 23rd, and it could have been August 22nd, it could have been August 24th, okay, approximately August 23rd until approximately September 3rd, 
And again, it could be August, September 2nd. The, the spooks can be weird about this stuff. Okay, they could say, well, there, it wasn't September 4th. So no. No, it could have been September 3rd, okay? It could have been September 2nd, right? And within a couple of days of this, my friend says that between the, at, at, at approximately 3 o'clock in the morning, strange vans, and there were just maybe three of them, he said, that not just a couple. The way he put it was a couple of vans. So we're thinking three, possibly four, but most likely three. A couple of vans arrived at 3 o'clock in the morning after the janitorial trucks had left the building. And it's very important because they were able to identify the vans according to make, model, color, and uh, there were no markings on the vans. But the janitorial vans did have markings. And so they were able to distinguish that these are not the same vans. And they know how the janitorial trucks left the building, and the, they actually tracked the paths that the janitorial trucks took to drive home. Like the janitorial workers were driving down certain roads to get over to, to their houses, and the CIA, or the FBI, the NSA folks tracked those people home. Um, and they're, they're, he was quite convinced that these are not the same trucks. And between the hours of 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock, these trucks had never been in this building before. It was an anomaly. Definitely, it wasn't like it was going on for months and months and it just continued. They showed up for 10 days, 10 or 11 days approximately. Then they were never seen again. And that's when they believed they wired the building. And they do believe, and, and, and my friend told me absolutely it was a thermite bomb, a thermite bomb with a, it was a thermite bomb with uh, potential sulfur in it. The sulfur, it makes it, uh, it is a, uh, the, the, the important thing about a thermite bomb is it is a, it is a, an extraordinary heat reducing bomb. Okay, it, 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 it creates, it takes steel and it creates molten steel. So it takes beams of steel and it turns it into molten steel. And it just rot, everything underneath just sinks into the ground like what you saw. And it is, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a special U.S. military-grade weapon, okay? It is a military-grade weapon. It's not something you could make ever in your kitchen or your, or your garage or your, or your living room. It is impossible for you to do this. This is a U.S. military weapon. And so I, uh, I do believe that that helps to explain uh, some, of the, the missing, some of the missing pieces and I believe this is what happened. Uh, they had known in it. They'd known about the terrorist attack for months. There is a long-term advanced knowledge. Assets are being watched. Uh, the 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 terror. These so-called terrorists, whether you want to think of them as re whether whether they're real. Mohammed Atta was an asset trained by the United States government, supervised by the United States government. And I can assure you that assets. And I'm speaking directly from my own personal experience. Assets are heavily controlled individuals. I was never dealing with Iraq and Libya without somebody paying extremely close attention to me at every stage. And my phones were tapped. I mean, at some point, they, they, had, they had wired my house. <laughs> when they had the handover of the two Libyan men, I went down to my basement the same day that they handed over the men. And my ceiling of my basement had been torn out. And there were cable wires dangling from the ceiling about a dozen cable wires. And I had a contractor come over to my house and he said, wow, you really, somebody really put a kick-ass stereo system in your house. That's amazing. He said, you have, you have these wires going to every single room of your house, even in your bathroom. And I was like, ew. You know? But yeah, but he, he was like, they, he said, it's everywhere. He said, you must have like a stereo system that just, you know, rocks in this house. Um, but... So anyway, but the point is, is that assets, they, they, there's no way that these assets could have functioned without everyone knowing every single detail of what they were doing. There's no way they could have hidden. They could not have disguised their actions from their handlers. Even if they tried to disguise it, it wouldn't work. Believe me, it wouldn't work. <laughs> they, you know, they, they you know, no, it's impossible. Impossible. And so it's more likely that they were using Muhammad Atta to guide the conspiracy, to track the conspiracy, and then they discovered that they were bozo pilots, they were clowns, they weren't any good at this flying stuff, and now they had an agenda. 
And the agenda was that when this attack happened, they were going to go to war with Iraq. But, oh gosh, we've got a problem now. Because the problem is they're not going to be able to do the job. Uh-oh. Oh, what a bummer. We're not going to be able if, if, see, see, here's the thing about all, and I'm speaking now for, again from... And so what's she saying? That uh, she doesn't know that they were being flown by the home run system? No, she knows nothing except the talk of aeroplanes. She doesn't know anything about how they actually no. did it? No, nothing. She just knows that planes are being used and she's very pedantic about stating only what she knew firsthand, not mm. repeating right. hearsay. Experience. The 1993 World Trade Center attack killed five people. The, b the bombing of the USS Cole killed 12 people. And once the smoke and clears and the catastrophe, the chaos is over and the noise is done, it's pretty, you know, it's like, it's, it's all, there's not a lot of damage that would just, that would certainly not enough that would allow a government, a pro-war cabal, to throw itself into a new war with Iraq, which they wanted to do. They've already decided to do it. And so that is the motivation. There can, the thing is, there can never be a, any police officer will tell you, there is no crime without a motive and opportunity. And we had both. So it's not like they just spontaneously wired the World Trade Center. They knew it was coming, and they wanted to make sure that they had maximum damage when it hit. They knew they were going to use the airplanes as the cover to demolish the building. So it's not, you know, a lot of people in the 9-11 truth community have gotten kind of, at first, when I first broke this news, they were like, you know, a lot of people attacked me, and they said, you're saying there were airplane hijackings. No, no, there was a demolition. And I'm like saying, no, no, there's both of it. Both things happened. They they knew this. They knew the airplanes were going to be hijacked, so they used it as a cover for the to, to guarantee maximum destruction because they already knew the consequence of war. So there you have it. <laughs> and, and okay, yes. I get what you said that your job was, your go-between. Your uh, I was a, a, it was called an asset. Right. Okay. I, I was an intelligence asset. I was supervised by handlers for the CIA and the Defense Intelligence Agency. I was not covert. This is very, I was covert from your end. Like you guys, the American people had no idea that Clinton, President Clinton had opened up a back channel because they didn't want you all to know this. But in fact, the, from the very first meetings that I had at the Iraqi embassy and the Libyan embassy, they were told who I was. They knew that I was a, a passionate anti-sanctions activist and passionately anti-war. I hated the first Gulf War. It protested the Gulf War. And uh, I wanted to do anything that I could to try to create a communication they couldn't have a formal communication because of the sanctions. They were officially on the pariah list, and yet they had to have some kind of communications and discussion in order to, res in order to, on terrorism specifically. Did you say pariah or pariah? I, I find it odd that your <laughs> boss doesn't you talk to people in the administration. Oh, they did. I know that he did. I know that he did. Like a did. Fire eye, like well, what, like what a he did, what he did was, uh, I believe, I believe, I'm well, wrong like about this, but I believe that he contributed to the White House memo on uh, the, 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 the presidential Bigger. directive instruction request. <laughs> there's, a, there's a formal term for that. I'm afraid I don't know what it is. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is. He did contribute to that, and he had vastly more information than I did. I was getting all my knowledge from him. But the fact that we needed some, we needed fast turnaround on this because we thought the attack was within a couple of weeks. In fact, the attack didn't occur for another, this was August 6th, and it occurred over a month later. But we thought that the attack could come as early as, you know, the third or fourth week of August. We thought it was imminent. And so... Well, he, he probably did also. Everybody was doing it. That's why it has See, to be the Jews. I mean, not, no offense, but there was so much.
much discussion about this attack. And for, and for Everybody was talking about Ooh, it. George Kennedy had love some it. meetings. Ooh. Other other analysts had meetings at the White House. That Condoleezza Rice is like Probably gets very really pretended call. didn't happen. Um, there, there was a, there was a lot of knowledge, and and the fact that I would be able to get the attorney general's attention and staff attention by saying I'm in direct contact with Iraq, that's kind of like a, that's like a bona fide thing that in the CIA that's like a, they call it bona fide. Yeah, exactly. We were we were, and it wasn't like a supervisory thing. At that point, they wanted someone with direct contact, because I had direct contact with the events, and I could cite that and say, you need to listen to me, because I speak with the, I spoke with the Iraqis on Saturday, and I need to tell you this. I spoke, you know, you see what I mean? So that's, I'm sure he also did, I, I know he did other things, too. Um, in the course of your talk, uh, you Have you done the age difference, Dummy, between you and... Oh, no, I haven't. I'm looking at magnets yet, no? <laughs> Magnet? Yeah, yeah. Karen, uh, favorite, strongest magnet in the world, made in a... It's in Florida. Yeah? Mm. That's Well, 4,000... Okay. It's an electromagnet. Yeah. Right, and she picked up paper clips from a simple nail that he ran wires up. This is the dude who works with them. He picked up paper clips for 4,000 times stronger than what he's uh, been you know, saying. This is a very good <laughs> question because. <laughs> but it's a left right magnet. It's yeah, really questionable that there was a jihadi plot. I do believe there were hijackers. Now, I, I have to tell you that I do believe there were hijackers. On the other hand, I know that they were the people that they did identify were assets. Okay? They worked for the United States government. And they were the men who did, who were identified as the, 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 uh, the, the hijackers were not jihadis. They were not devoutly religious men. Uh, they went to strip clubs, they drank alcohol, they dr smoked cigarettes, they chased women. Real, real deep, authentic jihadis would do none of that. They, they were, you know, and, and so it's really curious to me as to what their, I, I, and I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately, but what their final minutes must have been on this earth, what did they think they were doing? I, I truly do not know. I don't know if they thought it was just a training exercise. I don't know if they thought, I, I just don't know. But I don't think, I do not believe they were jihad, real jihadis. You say that there was a point in midsummer. 2001, when the CIA and uh, elements of the U.S. government became, may have become concerned that uh, having planned this event, prepared for it, that the uh, alleged jihadi pilots weren't going to be able to uh, accomplish the goal. Yeah. Well, now, according to the official version of 9 11, they did accomplish the goal of flying the airplanes into the building. And so, um, do you think that the CIA made a mistake and underestimated the well, talent of these pilots? Well, well, no, well, well here's the thing. Um, they, they did fly into the building. Of course, they did. And they could have been on automatic pilot. That makes sense. Um, we know that there was a heightened GPS and heightened cell phone activity um, that, that is very unusual. Uh, usually the, the GPS only works to, uh, it, it doesn't work at certain altitudes. And at a scale of like 1 to 10, the GPS signal was working at a 10, whereas ordinarily it might work at a 4. See? And so something was helping boost, and, and it had to be boosted. It, could not have, it couldn't have just spontaneously done this on its own. Something had to be boosting the GPS signal. And that's, 
and it's just a matter of scientific requirement that it had to be boosted, and it was. Um, the cell phone was the same thing. I, you know, some people have tried to say that the cell phone conversations did not happen. I do believe they did happen. I do believe that people got through to their their spouses. But again, you see that it had to be some. Uh, there had to be some 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 technological boost for it to be done. And I think that they got the hijackers got a lot of help. They got a lot of help. Imagine that. 
The government is arguing that we don't have to give this woman a hearing. We can just lock her up indefinitely. And I was the test case on this, and it was horrible. And, and they wanted to for lock me up and forcibly drug me at the same time so that I would be so destroyed. They told the judge that they had no idea how long my cure, my cure, was going to take, but they wanted it. Uh, the judge in my case was Michael Mukasey. Michael Mukasey later became U.S. Attorney General, and I fought so hard, and my beloved companion, sweet, wonderful Jay Fields, who, is, who died of cancer, unfortunately, never lived to see me exonerated. Uh, he fought in the blogs, and he fought on alternative radio, because the corporate media refused to cover my story. They would not... They didn't want to tell you what was going on. Um, they, they said that they, they implied very strongly that I was a religious maniac. And, and I do believe in God. And I have a spiritual life. Yes, I do. But I'm not, a, I'm not a religious maniac. I guess a religious maniac would be someone like the Elizabeth Smart uh, rapist, kidnapper, who went into court and was like spouting religious stuff and was singing up hymns, standing up and singing hymns in court. Stuff like that. They wanted me to. Yeah, yeah. It was and and when they when they realized that um, the yeah when they, they there was actually a I call it my Amnesty International moment. Uh, they had already uh, the, the Justice Department had already petitioned to forcibly drug me, and I was waiting for a decision. And one morning I was in I was locked up in prison at this, at this point. Uh, I had been held on Carswell Air Force Base for eight months. And then I was moved to the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York for four months. And one morning, they, at 5.30 in the morning, I, the, the guard wakes me up, he shakes me, he says, you're going to court today. And I'm like weeping. I'm thinking that they've got the decision and they're going to like send me back to Carswell to be drugged and I'm hysterical. I was absolutely hysterical. And I get into the courtroom and, and my, my, I'm in a holding cage that's about the size of this table. And they, and they come in, my attorney comes in and he says, Oh my God, someone has started a blog on your case, and people are writing your judge. They're writing Judge McCasey, you got to tell your friend to stop doing this. I was like, never, no, <laughs> no way. And I was like, and I was like, we are never, and literally I grabbed the bars, I was like, we are never going to stop. You are, we are going to fight to defend this Constitution. You are breaking the law. And we are never going to shut up until this is done. You, you can tell that crooked prosecutor that he can just go to hell because we're going to keep talking until, the, you know, you're never going to shut me up now. <laughs> you know, this was a mistake. <laughs> this was a huge mistake that they did this to me. Um, and we went in and the judge was like, you know, so. And at that point, the, uh, Jay had published psych records. When, when I, after my arrest, I had been ordered to have uh, attend, we, this actually saved me. Uh, I, I had been ordered to attend weekly psychology meetings. Uh, I had never had any psychological problems, and I had a year's worth of documentation saying that I suffered no mental illness, no depression, no psychosis, no mania, no nothing, no mood disturbances. And, and these are in the back of my book, so you can actually look at this stuff for yourself, and you can see the papers with your own eyes, and you can read them. And, and, he, and he, the judge was like, well, this is extraordinary. You're telling me this woman is incompetent and she's suffering from this grave mental illness, and yet she I'm has sure all these records on which are on the bloody internet. Why are these papers not in my courtroom? And the judge was like, uh-uh, this is just not going to happen. Well, well, and at that remember, point, I was saved. The train, the train. Because the judge was like, this is, this is, this, this, you know, this, is, this day, woman is not cooperative. You know, if I had been cooperative, in, uh, you know, they would have done down, it. If I had been passive, they would have done it. But I mean, I'm a fighter, and they still Hebrew wouldn't get Hebrew is frail and weak. 360.4 weak is talent, or a circle, and there's nothing in uh, Greek. Uh, years is 6.907 in Hebrew is a goblet, dregs. In Greek, 690 is Arab. Um, hmm, that's not a lot there. I'll do it between you and. All right. 
Mm-hmm. Give me a hearing. And I mean, I know how to fight. I'm an activist and an athlete. Believe me, I know how to fight. And they would, and it was like the Patriot Act was so hideous, so big, so powerful that there, there was nothing that they were going to let it break through. But Judge Mukasey also did the financial case on the 9-11, the insurance claims for 9-11, for Larry Silverstein, who went to his synagogue. They both attend the same synagogue. Yeah. Cozy. Very cozy. I do not know. I do not know. If, see, I wonder about all these things because I wonder if they thought that it was like a, a practice or if they thought, you know, they, this was just like, I, I don't, I do not know the answer to that. It's like, it's fascinating to think what they must have thought. I know 
that a lot of people would say, well, that's not fair to do to the Iraqis. And I agree with you. <laughs> I agree with you. But it was what the CIA wanted. And they were going to have every single thing that they could think to get. And uh, they wanted, and, and at the same time, we all knew that it would have to be tremendous to appease George Bush, because he was out for, you know, the Daddy Bush fantasy, this delusion. It was a delusion. But the one group that was not going to benefit was the military-industrial complex. And they were going to be the big losers in this whole thing. They were not going to be able to have their wars. They were not going to be able to sell their military weapons systems. The $400 billion, we wouldn't need all this for this equipment or that equipment. They wouldn't need any of it. And so they were the losers, and, and they were just too powerful. You know? This isn't actually a question, but a brief comment. Okay. Uh, we were talking about the uh, Pennsylvania uh, Flight 93 uh, crash, alleged crash. Yeah. And I just want to say that uh, anyone can claim to have, any pilot can claim to have shot down the airliner. That's easy to claim something like that, but it did happen. And I just want to point out that not only was there no plane debris at the alleged crash site, but neither was there debris field anywhere else. And we know from incidents like the Lock and Beast that when a plane blows uh, over land, it leaves the debris field. But there was yeah. no debris field uh, uh, to be shown. Uh, so well, it's, it's also it's like also the Pentagon. It's also the same the story. Pentagon. See, they uh, I do not both planes the Pentagon, that were supposedly uh, shot was down or hit by an airplane. Went into I mean, the Pentagon. They're, they're saying you know, they, they, they're all elsewhere. that debris suddenly was magically just removed. But it was never destroyed. <laughs> you know, there was no airplane there either. So it was a rocket. So it, it's, in you know, there's a still a lot of questions Pentagon. about 9/11 that I cannot but answer. But what do I do with the people? You, Again, I'm same sorry. story. I wish I, you know, these are good questions you're asking. And it's not like I'm trying to blow you off. There's just some things I don't know. But hopefully I'm going to give you enough new information that you'll be able to, like, put some more... No, if that doesn't... Uh, Kick the ancient uh, gear, I don't know what would. You've already got her. I mean, you've got her, who I only know her limited, because that's all she was taught. But now you've got people in positions of, and, and the military knowing that it was Mossad behind it. Right. It's, so that's the it's two years ago. Um, in light of that, uh, I think you're probably aware that, that it's been documented. There were somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 See, and there's no way in the world that the Jews could uh, put 300 uh, nuclear devices uh, in 300 cities in the world. Yeah. If it only got found out in one. Exactly the scenario yeah. that we're told uh, transpired, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, so the point is they are probably, totally uh, been observed by the powers of be that would immediately disarm it. Ramsey Youssef 
in the Philippines in 1995, and they found the, the the blueprint for this 9/11, what became the 9/11 attack, on his computer. Okay, and they and he called it Project Bojinka. And at that point, the military began to run uh, simulated uh, counter strategies for what you would do if there was an airplane hijacking scenario that was attacking various targets throughout the United States. And one of the targets was the Pentagon. And then the Pentagon said it was too outrageous that anybody, nobody would actually attack the Pentagon this way. So maybe they should drop the Pentagon scenario. So they did. But even though they had rehearsed Project Bojinka, on 9-11, uh, on September 10th through September 12th, NORAD was on high alert on doing military exercises uh, because this, allegedly the, the former Soviet Union, the Russians, were doing their military exercises so we timed our military exercises allegedly to theirs. And they were supposed to be on heightened alert just in, in the course of practice. They were supposed to be on heightened alert for any invasion of sovereignty of airspace, sovereign airspace, on those dates. And yet, even though the military was on high alert, they took no action when the, uh, when the airplanes were hijacked and, and, they, they, and, and they didn't scramble. They didn't do any, they broke all of their own protocols. <laughs> well, weren't they mostly sent up in, in directions? Yes. Away from the there you go. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. And they sent one jet. They turned one jet around and sent it after one fighter to go track them. They were already on drills and they exercises that had already taken them out and basically left the Eastern Seaboard. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is supposed to be the Smartest military in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. There you go. There and, 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 yeah, exactly. Well, they were the Did you chat with that on the thing? No, no, no. Well, 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 and the guy who was, uh, who was okay. allegedly flying the whole plane that was involved in the shooting down night street, who they don't want you to know about who's been, you know, who was held in prison for a couple of years at least. And I don't know if he's out or not. I mean, they gave him a real hard time. So, yeah. So, could you remind me again what the sanctions were for? And the question. And then, I just wanted to get clear about what you were arrested for. Good. Um, the sanctions were on uh, to punish Iraq for allegedly having weapons of mass destruction. And they said that Iraq would, they would keep the sanctions on Iraq until all weapons of mass destruction were confirmed to have been destroyed. Now, it appears that they were actually destroyed by the end of 96 or 97, but the United States was, you know, had an ulterior agenda, which was they were not going to let go of the sanctions until uh, Saddam was out of power. But what had happened was, by the year 2000, while Bill Clinton was still in office, the international loathing for sanctions had become intense. Two million people had died from sanctions. Uh, well, between 1.7 million and 2.2 million had died. Uh, and, the, and the international community was violating the sanctions. The German pilots were filed, and Jordanian pilots were filed. Actually, they was coming from all over Europe. Germany was the first. And they had pilots fly humanitarian supplies over the air through sovereign airspace and land at Baghdad Airport, and then a whole bunch of other countries followed suit, and they were all like, we're, we're not going to do this. This is wrong. It is immoral. It is a crime against humanity, and we recognize that. And so at that point, the CIA, I, I wanted to do it, but at that point, the CIA knew that they were losing control of the situation and that they better step in and do something. And I, I, I wanted to end the sanctions, so I was glad the pilots were doing this. But the CIA was very, very expedient. It was politically expedient. They had they were losing control of the situation. They wanted to take back their power. I was arrested for uh, I was arrested. Uh, I was accused of several things. One, I was accused of acting as an unregistered Iraqi agent because I had delivered a letter to my cousin, who was the chief of staff to George Bush, telling him that the war in Iraq would be catastrophic, and begging him uh, and, and outlining several. Now this is interesting, very, very interesting, considering 
that we watched the Iran movie just um, a little while. And I, I, I thought uh, to no, myself, no, no, the consequences no, no, no. like democracy would throw power to Islamic fundamentalists, and there, there would be a rise of terrorist attacks, and the Iraqi people hated the sanctions.